good morning. It's Friday morning, and i uh, got to kind of get on with it <clears throat> because there are many things to do today, and if I don't uh, get this done, it may not get done today. Uh, we've got to go down to the church and, and do some work, and then i got some work here to do at the house. I have a plumbing task to do today, and so, uh, you know, we never know what's going to happen when that starts. But uh, uh, to all my friends, uh, the tornado bypassed us. And uh, I know there's some damage around, but there is none at my house. Uh, God was gracious to us this time. It wasn't my turn this time. It's been my turn before, as you know, with trees through the roof and everything else. <laughs> But uh, but not this time, and we're very, very grateful, believe me. Uh, we're in, in Jeremiah chapter 30. We talked about how this is probably the first thing that he wrote because God told him to write it down. It may not have occurred to him to write it down until God told him to. That's always a good wouldn't it be wonderful if it didn't occur, occur to us to do something until God told us to? Just think about how much trouble we could stay out of. <laughs> but God bless you all. I hope you all made it safely through the storm yesterday evening. It has gone somewhere else to blow for now. Yesterday, we'll just back up a little bit. We'll go back to verse 10, where we were yesterday. Therefore, fear not, O my servant Jacob, saith the Lord, neither be dismayed, O Israel, for lo, I will save thee from afar and thy seed from the land of their captivity. And Jacob shall return and shall be in rest and shall be quiet, and none shall make him afraid. He's writing this probably 30 plus years before their captivity. Maybe more, 35 possibly. For I am with thee, saith the Lord, to save thee. Though I make a full end of the nations, whither I have scattered thee, yet will I not make a full end of thee. There's always a remnant. There's a remnant of the church of Jesus right now. You know, if you look around your church and you don't know what's going on, you probably one of the remnant. <laughs> so a remnant, a re member, a remnant member, a member of the remnant church is uh, someone who believes every word of the Bible without, without any explanation or equivocation. You interpret the Bible literally, it means exactly what it says. There are no errors. There are no contradictions. It means exactly what it says and where to do exactly what it says. You believe in the cross of Jesus Christ, that his blood paid for your sins and the sins of the whole world and not just for the special few. Jesus died for the world. He came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. And whosoever will may come and whosoever meaneth me. <laughs> you may be a remnant, mem a member of the remnant church. If you believe Jesus' blood washes away all sin and that there's power in the blood. And it is only by the sacrifice of Christ on Calvary. That, that, that buys our way out of hell. It's all about the cross. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. It's all Jesus. You may be a member of the remnant church if you believe the gospel and that it is the gospel alone that 
transforms us from sinners into saints. You might be a member of the Remnant Church if you believe that there's only two kinds of people in the world, lost sinners and saved sinners. Which one are you? You believe in the book, the blood, and the blessed hope. Jesus is coming soon. He's coming any day to rescue his church and take him out of here. We will be in heaven while the great tribulation is going on, and then we will return with Jesus at his second coming. We will destroy or we will watch him destroy the armies of the Antichrist at the Battle of Armageddon, and then he will sit on the throne of his father David in Jerusalem and reign for a thousand years, and we will be kings and priests and judges under him, ruling and reigning at his discretion. And there shall his servants serve him. The remnant, he always saves a remnant. It revolves around the book, the blood, and the blessed hope. If all your activity, if all your thoughts, if your mind is not stayed completely upon these things, you're lost as a goose and you have no understanding of the Bible. Jesus Christ in him crucified. The only way you can know Jesus is through the word of God. That's the book. The only way you can belong to Jesus is through the blood. And the only way that you can go to Jesus is through the blessed hope. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren. Paul wrote concerning them which sleep. And he says, I should have planned for this, but I didn't. I read this at every funeral, so I ought to know. But, but I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. My only hope is the blessed hope. Got no hope in Biden. Got no hope in Trump. Got no hope in Congress. Got no hope in any of. Uh, you know, any guy in a tie that they're going to vote into the legislature in Missouri. I got no hope in any of them. Got no hope in preachers. Got no hope in music. Got no hope in money. Got no hope in a job. My only hope is in the blessed hope. This is what it means when Paul says that we were aliens without Christ, without hope. Our hope is that he comes back and gets us. He says, and he's coming back. Our only hope is the blessed hope. That blessed hope is his return at the rapture. I'm getting a little choked up when I think about that. Because there's too many times when I'm remiss, when I should be almost panting and waiting for him to come. As you wait for your lover to come to you. Because you love Jesus so much, you just can't stand to be another day without him. Good morning, Chris. He's with me all the time, but I want to see his face. I want to see him like he is, and I want to be like him. He's coming back for me. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. The blessed hope is my only hope, the appearing of Jesus. He says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will return again that I may receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. I'm going to come and get you.
And it's going to happen like this, but I will not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. That you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and we do, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend with the sh with, from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. You're part of the remnant if you believe that. I hate to say this, but most people today don't even believe that Jesus is coming back. I'm talking about most church people. If they believe it, you'd never know because they don't talk about it in their church. Now, they talk about uh, politics. And they talk about social justice. And they talk about feeding the poor and the halt and the lame and all this stuff. You know, I've been active in that for, I don't know, over 10 years now. Very active in social work. Uh, working with homeless people and working with addicts. Working at homeless shelters, rescue missions, recovery church. I do a lot of that stuff, but that won't save anybody. Only giving the gospel to another person can save them. If they don't hear the word of God, then they can't come to God for refuge. If they don't come to God, if they don't believe the gospel, then Jesus will not save them. If we do social work without giving the gospel, we just, you know, they just go to hell with a bath instead of dirty. You know, if you help a drunk get sober, and he doesn't go to Christ. He just goes to hell dry. I can talk like that. I, I used to be a drunk. I am not an alcoholic. I was never an alcoholic. I was a drunk. Jesus saved me and delivered me from drink. I don't drink anymore. So I'm not a drunk anymore. We have to somehow in society today, we have to come up with constructs to make it look like sin is not our fault. Sin is my fault. If I'm a drunk, it's my fault. Not my daddy's fault. It's not my genes. It's not my DNA. It's not my sugar level. It's not my thyroid. It's nothing like that. It's all a bunch of noise. And it's a lie. It's the lie of the world to tell you that your sin is not your sin and that there's some other way to get away from it than the blood of Christ. Now, I know that my AA friends will take a dim view of what I just said, but I don't care. I'll be 70 years old on my next birthday. I've gotten beyond caring what anybody else says about anything. I spent all this time figuring out what I think. I don't care about what anybody else thinks. I know that the word of God is true. And there's always a remnant. If you believe the word of God is true. And the word of God says that in my flesh there dwelleth no good thing. And that I'm capable of any sin. And it's sin is not, my sin is not somebody else's fault. It's not because I got a disease or because I got a sickness. It's because I'm a sinner. 
Sin is the disease and Jesus Christ is the cure. He'll always save a remnant. For I am with thee, saith the Lord, to save thee, though I make a full end of all the nations, whither I have scattered thee, yet will I not make a full end of thee. But I will correct thee in measure, and will not leave thee altogether unpunished. For thus saith the Lord, thy bruise is incurable, thy wound is grievous. And there is none to plead thy cause, that thou mayest be bound up. Thou hast no healing medicines. We went deeply into that yesterday. Good morning, Gala. God bless you. Uh, now, we pick up today. Remember, this is probably Jeremiah's earliest writing during the heyday of good King Josiah, during the big revival, when all the higher-ups pretended to have a revival because it pleased the good King Josiah, but they did not have a revival in their hearts. They just did what the king said to get along with the king. I always thought that was kind of sad. They pretended, they pretended to love God, but they didn't. Their wives were still baking cakes to the Queen of Heaven and crying for Tammuz. Their their men were still in secret, bowing down and worshiping the sun. They were still going to the high places and worshiping Baal and the Ashtaroths. Those are the groves. They were still sacrificing their children. It was just a pretend revival. Beloved, I hope you're not in a pretend revival. If you're playing church, quit playing and get serious. If you worship Christ, then get serious about it. He requires everything. We can't withhold anything from him. We can't say that this is a little part of my life I want to keep for me. That doesn't exist anymore. It all belongs to him. You either serve him or you don't. Now, I know in this day and age, that sounds like really, really draconian and dogmatic and harsh. And I guess it is draconian, dogmatic and harsh. But we serve a God who... <laughs> <laughs> who, who does not entertain excuses. As a matter of fact, the Lord Jesus will forgive every sin, every sin. But, you know, in the whole New Testament or the Old Testament for that matter, I don't find any instance at all of God forgiving an excuse. If you find such a passage, please let me know and enlighten me. Let me know. You see, you know somebody who's a hard case, although he'll forgive any sin and he's tender, the hard case is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Because he either has all of you or he has none of you. You either have all of him, or you have none of him. It explains it in the parable of the talents in chapter 25 of Matthew. And it says, you know, I'm never going to assume everybody knows everything. But let's just read this for our edification. In chapter 25 of Matthew, verse 14, For the kingdom of heaven it says a man traveling into a far country, who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods, and unto one he gave five talents, that's a weight, a measure of gold or silver, a weight in silver, and to another two, and to another one, and to every man according to his several ability, and straightway took his journey. 
Then he that had received the five talents went and traded them the same, and he made other five talents, he made five more. And likewise, he that had received two, he also gained other two. He got two more. So he gave every man according to his ability. I'm not going to be judged by the gifts of Billy Graham. Billy Graham preached to millions of people, preached all over the world, no matter, I don't know how many people came to Christ through Billy Graham Crusades. Well, see, I don't have that opportunity, and I don't have that skill, and I don't have that talent, and I don't have those gifts that God gave him. He did not give me the same thing in measure. He's only going to hold me responsible for what I do with what he gave me. He's not going to judge me by Billy Graham's standards or Abraham Lincoln's standards or President Kennedy. He's not going to judge me by some other great, some great man's standards. He's not even going to judge me uh, by the standard of another average man like me. He's going to judge me on what he gave me and what did I do with what he gave me. He'll do the same for you. So the one that he gave two talents, he gained two more because that's all he could do. That's why God gave him two talents. He said, well, and he's pretty sharp. He can give me two more. Why didn't he give the one that he had that, that had five talents? Why didn't he give him seven? Because God knew that he could earn five. See how simple it is? We try to make this a mystery. It's not a mystery. But he that had received one talent went and digged in the earth and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoneth with them. And so he that had received five talents came and brought other five talents, saying, Lord, thou deliverest unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained beside them five talents more. And his Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Well, that's all I want to hear anymore. I just the the only thing I'm listening, I'm listening for a trumpet. I want to hear a trumpet. And then I want Jesus to hear Jesus saying, well done, thou good and faithful servant. That's all I care about anymore. I'm not looking for signs. I'm listening for the trumpet. And he reckoned with him. And so he said, uh, it says, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. See, he, get, he may only expect us to get according to what he gave us, but he's going to give us beyond our ability to even imagine or think. Uh, and it says, uh, he that received two talents said, Lord, thou deliverest unto me two talents. Behold, I've gained two other talents beside them. His Lord said unto him, well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I'll make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Boy, don't, don't you want to hear that? Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Oh, what a day that's going to be, huh? Man, I just, uh, I can't imagine it. I'm going to crack up like I did yesterday if I don't get off this pretty soon, but I want to tell you, I'm not worthy to have his name in my mouth and speak it out loud where other people can hear it. And yet he chose to save me. He found me. He picked me up. He set me down in a large place where he had room to build a world around me. He is a great king. He is the great Lord. He is the great and mighty God. <sighs> Gonna make me ruler over something. When I do good to remember to take my grocery list so I don't forget everything, but he's going to make me ruler over many things. I can't even hardly imagine that. The song says, I can only imagine, but <laughs> I can't get that far. <clears throat> then when he received the one talent came, said, Lord, I knew that thou art a hard man. And when he is, he's a hard man. You're either in or you're out. You're not going to be able to talk your way into heaven, beloved. You're not going to be able to go up to Jesus and say, I did this, that, and the other, because he knows everything. And he'll says, 
Depart from me, ye that work at iniquity. I never knew you. I never knew you. You need to know him. And when you know him, he'll know you. I know that thou art a hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown, and gathering where thou hast not strawed. And I was afraid, and went and hid, my ta hid thy talent in the earth. And, lo, there is that, that is, that, blah, 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 there thou hast, that is thine. And his Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knewest that I reap where I sowed not, and gather where I have not strawed. Thou oughtest therefore to have put my money to the exchangers, and at my coming I should have received mine own with usury. Take therefore the talent from him, and give it to the one which hath ten talents. For every one that hath shall be given, and he that hath shall have abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath, and cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There shall be the weeping and the gnashing of teeth. There's going to be the weeping and the gnashing of teeth someday. But if you believe in all those things I just said, the both the blood and the blessed hope, and you put your faith in the cross and what Jesus did on it, I mean, Jesus and Jesus alone, then you're part of the remnant church. You're going to heaven. He comes back today. You're going up with him. He'll call you up to him. He'll say, come up hither, and you'll go. Revelation 4, verse 1, come up hither. I heard a trumpet and a voice from heaven saying, come up hither. That's the rapture. Verse 14, all thy lovers have forgotten thee, they forsake thee not. No, my eyes were bleary. All thy lovers have forgotten thee, they seek thee not. They seek, look like forsake in my blurred vision. Sorry. All thy lovers have forgotten me. They seek thee not, for I have wounded thee with the wound of an enemy and with the chastisement of a cruel one for the multitude of thine iniquity, because thy sins were increased. Now, why is that? So that they would come to repentance. You see, the Holy Ghost points out our sin and convicts us of sin so that we will understand that we're a sinner. See, if you don't understand that you're a sinner, that you've offended a holy God, you can't get saved. There is no salvation without repentance. Jesus said, I've come, I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. The trick is a trick question. You see, we're all sinners. For all of sin, it comes short of the glory of God. There is none that doeth righteousness, no, not one. And the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. See, he opens our sin up so we can see it. That's what the Holy Ghost does. That is how we come to the cross. Why would you run to refuge if you didn't think anything was chasing you? Hell is on your heels. The devil's chasing you. Come to Christ, friend. The devil is after you. He wants you for his own. He doesn't want you to go to heaven. He wants you to burn in hell with him. The devil will not rule in hell. <laughs> He'll spend eternity and the lake of fire with everybody he's led there ever since Cain, the first murderer. The first murderer. You see, unless the Holy Ghost shows us our sin. God says here that I've wounded you. I've opened you up. I've treated you like I was cruel because of your sin. Your wounds are open. Your sin is open where I can see it. But more importantly, I know it's there. It's so that you can see it, friend. 
So you can see, God says. See, the Holy Ghost, when he comes, chapter 16 to John, Jesus says, Nevertheless, I tell you, verse 7, that the truth, nevertheless, I tell you the truth, Jesus said, this is expedient for you that I go away, for if I go not away, the comforter will not go. Why they call him the comforter? He's the convictor, right? Oh, yeah, he is. But see, after he convicts you, he comforts you because he comforts you in the arms of Jesus. It is the Holy Ghost who makes us understand that we're sinners. It is the Holy Ghost who points us to the cross and glorifies Christ. And it's the Holy Ghost who makes us understand just enough to get saved. We understand that Jesus on the cross was nailed to the cross, that he was crucified, that he suffered, he bled and died for our sins, that he was buried, that he rose the third day. And his blood washes away our sin. His blood buys our way out of hell. For you are not bought with silver and with gold, with precious stones, but with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ crucified. It's the Holy Ghost who makes you believe that. And then when you accept that, you repent of your sin. What sin? The sin that the Holy Ghost showed you. You can't go to Christ until you see your sin. If you go to Christ without repenting, you'll think he's your buddy or your pal or your, <clears throat> you know, your bro. No, no bro. <laughs> the Holy Ghost, before, the cup, before he's the comforter, he's the convictor. And he says in verse 8, And when he, the Holy Ghost, has come, he will reprove the world of sin. Reprove is an old English word. It doesn't just mean rebuke. It rebukes you. It tells you why you're wrong. But when you reprove somebody, you tell them what to do to make it right. And what you do to make your sin right is to come to Jesus and surrender to him. Repent of your sin and call on his name. Whosoever should call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Of sin, of righteousness, of judgment. The Holy Ghost convicts us of sin because they believe not on me. You don't believe before you believe, right? Of righteousness, because I go to my Father and you see me no more. The only righteousness in the world at this moment is Jesus Christ incarnate walking around on the earth. And there will be no righteousness when he leaves except for the comforter to come and live in the believer. And because the Holy Ghost lives in the believer, we have the righteousness of God for he was made, for he made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. We might be made the righteousness of God in him. Well, I'm just like going on and on of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. Every time a Christian is saved, every time a sinner is saved, Every time God opens our wounds and we see our sins, the Holy Ghost shows us our sins. The Holy Ghost convicts us of sin. Then the Holy Ghost directs us to the cross and we plead to Jesus to save us from a devil's hell. And he does. And at that moment, the Spirit of Christ, the Holy Ghost comes to live inside us. And when the Holy Ghost comes to live inside us, we then have and possess in our possessions, in our souls, the righteousness of Christ. And when God the Father looks at me, doesn't see Jimmy the sinner, he sees Jesus. When he looks at me, he sees Jesus. When Satan looks at me, he sees the old Jimmy the sinner. But when God the Father looks at me, he sees Jesus. Because the Holy Ghost has sealed me until the day of redemption. I have Jesus Christ's blood on my head, just like the blood of the lamb on the doorpost and on the lintel. In the Passover, and Jesus said what uh, God said, well, it was Jesus because he's the word. He's the one who spoke from heaven. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. When I see the blood, when I see the blood, when I see the blood, I will pass, I will pass over you. I kind of like this my whiskers now. It's, my face got tired of me shaving, and I kind of got a Walter Brennan deal going in here. <laughs> Dead nabbit. <laughs> John, I want to go with you. <laughs> Get back in there, Stumpy, and guard Joe Burdett. Um, 
we're going to leave this today. We only, <clears throat> we only got one verse today because I wanted to show you that if you believe, you are the remnant. God is talking about bringing a specific remnant back. I have all kinds of passages to read from Isaiah and Ezekiel about that, but we can't get there today because I took off to preach about the blood of Jesus. I don't think I should get counted off for that. <laughs> I shouldn't get... Now, if I was in college, they might take off my grade because I preached on the subject that I wasn't assigned. But when I got to the verse that uh, our, our wounds aren't bound up and there's no medicine for us, I had to talk about the medicine. The medicine is Jesus Christ. You won't have to get it refilled. <laughs> it's a one-time shot. You get a shot of Jesus and, and you're saved. Now, I realize that there's a lot of people running around these days think they're saved, and there's always been that aren't saved as all and they at all, and they wouldn't know Jesus if he came out of a space capsule like Elvis in the Ray Stevens song. But <clears throat> I know this too, that whoever Jesus saves is saved forever. So if you've fallen down, it doesn't matter what you think or how you feel. You still belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. You just get up where you are, dust yourself off, and take off walking again because he's never left you. He said, I will never leave you or forsake you. You don't have to look for it. He's in you. God bless you.